Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are glad that you're in this place of worship today. Um, I, uh, I missed you last week. I was playing hooky, uh, but I did tune, out, tune in to the uh, online, uh, online service uh, last Sunday morning to be able to see what was going on and how it went. And I appreciated so much Joe being in the pulpit and, and Jackie for, uh, for giving leadership up here. And, uh, and I'm, my only problem is they, when, they, when they let you out a little earlier than when I'm here, it always makes me look bad like that. But I so appreciate you being here and being faithful in your worship. Thank you. Just, uh, just in order to keep you mindful of what's going on today uh, is district conference in the Erie Meadville district uh, of the uh, Western Pennsylvania United Methodist Church. So that's going to be at three o'clock. It's by Zoom. Uh, there are some people going to be in person at, at Sagertown, but I just wanted you to know that's coming. Most of you do not have to worry about being there, but I thought it was a good time for me to, to explain to you a little bit of how the denomination works, all right? Uh, there is district conference, which is just the Erie Meadville, and then later on in June comes annual conference. I believe that's not going to be an in-person meeting as well. I believe that'll be, uh, I believe that's going to be by Zoom this year again. And then, of course, general conference, uh, which usually meets every four years, but has been postponed the last two years. Uh, it, it meets, and that's from, from United Methodists all over the world are part of the general conference. There is another layer now, just so that you understand this, because you know the denomination has been working hard over these last uh, four years particularly as to, as to what the future direction of the United Methodist Church will be. Uh, will, there be a, will there be one, two, or three expressions of Methodism with one being more progressive and one being more traditional and maybe something in the middle? And uh, so the one that's working on the more traditional expression is called the Global Methodist Church right now. Western, uh, Western Covenant Association has been a range of that. And they met on Thursday and Friday and again yesterday. So when we talk about those things, I just want you to know there's lots of, lots of things going on. And we're praying for what direction, the direction that the congregations will be going. So when you hear those things, I just want to keep them in front of you so that you know that United Methodists are meeting uh, an awful lot all the time. And uh, we want to do so in order to keep making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So if you were aware of that, I think that would be good. I uh, want to just simply uh, encourage you as you continue to, to talk to your friends, make sure that you're letting people know that we are back in worship and doing in-person worship. Uh, we just uh, were able to find out today, uh, knowing that, that we've gone for a, about a, a year and three months maybe, without the choir, and I miss them tremendously, but we are geared up for that coming up in September, and I believe if all things continue to move the direction we think, uh, the choir will be able to begin meeting again uh, coming up in the near future in September. So those are just some of the things I wanted you to be aware of and, and as you'd be praying about it as well. Um, having said that, if we're re ready to worship, I just ask you to silence your, your hearts, uh, quiet your mind, and, uh, and just invite God's presence into this place.
For the call to worship today, we're going to be reading scripture. We're going to read some of the words that Jesus read a long time ago. And if you will just give attention to, and just remain seated by the way, but this is really uh, taken from Luke 4, and I pick up in verse 16. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, so was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And of course, when Jesus was done, he would sit down, he would sit down and begin to, to teach. They would stand to read, and then they would sit down to teach. I've been thinking about sitting down to preach, and I think I can go another half hour if I were to do that probably wouldn't be appreciated by you at all. But that's the good news. And that was the pattern of Jesus when they would worship, to read the scripture, sit down, and the teaching would take place. Sometimes they would read another passage of scripture and then sit down once again. Well, I invite you, as, as, we, as we have already heard how Jesus would begin his worship, I invite you to stand as we sing together. Here I am, Lord, number 593.
while Bob is getting ready to share a song with us. I was just thinking while we were singing that song, Clark and Kara, I was thinking about you here. Do you realize that the first time I heard this song was in South Harbor Creek, probably about 1986 or seven. And uh, of course this song was written by a Catholic gentleman. And so that was that folk choir that came up from Our Lady of Mercy that, that sang that in the, in, the, in the church where we were at at that, at that time. And I've, I've always been grateful that uh, that's one of the songs that the, our Roman Catholic friends had provided for us and have moved into much of Protestant singing and such. But another one that goes way back is a song that Bob is getting ready to sing. And will you give attention as he ministers to us? Sing with me if you will. Good to be able to put Bob to work. The reason we were able to put him to put him to work this week is I needed to have a lot of work done in my car, and I felt like I invested so much in his life that I needed him to come back and <laughs> do that with me. He says that I'm not the first person to tease him about things like that. That's hard to believe. Thank you very much, Bob. I tell you, as we continue to to bring from an uh, increase of what God has blessed us with during this week. And you've been finding the offering plate. We, we, uh, we continue to do it. Your faithfulness blesses me greatly. And, um, and so really at this time, if we have the opportunity to give God thanks, uh, and don't forget as you are bringing in coins for the children's offerings, all the coins for the children's offerings are going to Wesley Woods. So uh, if you're wanting to be given in that particular area, that's one of the things we can do as you look for the, the collection of the coins and or whatever you're wanting to put in that. But thank you so much for finding that. I want to invite you to stand together maybe as we sing the doxology. <laughs>
Lord, we give you thanks for your nurture, for your care, for your provision, for income, for homes, for vehicles, um, for opportunities to share with neighbors. All these things, Lord, are provided by you. And we give back to you, Lord, asking that you use these gifts for your kingdom here and around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I probably can get into a little bit of trouble whenever I ask people to help me that I haven't asked before. But how many of you would, would like to hear Steve Coleman read out of a book that I've got right here? Would anyone like to hear Steve read? It's a very simple book. Steve, would you be willing to come? He'll never help me again, folks. I, I know what's going to happen here. This is, this is called the New Testament. I wondered if you would read page 10. Yeah. It's blank. That comes after 9. Oh. Nine's blank, too. You know why I can't read that? There's not a thing in this book, by the way. This is called the New Testament for Unwritten Languages. You can go back now. All right. I hope I haven't ruined it for life here. <laughs> I don't want it to get down to the bank that Steve can't read here. I think that would really be bad news here. Yeah, have you ever seen this book like this? New Testament for Unwritten Languages. How many of you back there are glad I didn't call you up to read? I know exactly what you're thinking here. New Testament for Unwritten Languages. You realize that there are places around the world that do not have the scripture written in their language. And there are also places around the world that do not even have a written language yet. One of the things that uh, uh, Wycliffe Bible translators do, and of course we, one part of our mission's uh, emphasis in, in this congregation is also JARS, Jungle Aviation and Radio Service, which is the airplane flying branch of, of, uh, of, of Wycliffe. And I say this to say to, my, to my, my younger friends, and those of you who might be watching at home as well, uh, for all the children, is that, is that they don't even have the, the books that are easier to read. There's not even pictures for them to be able to understand the good news about Jesus. And so their book is empty. And one of the things that we pray about, and one of the things that we want to participate even in our missions program, is supporting the people who go into these foreign lands or go into these places where there is not even a written language and they help develop an alphabet phonetically, they develop characters, and, uh, and they, they put together a, a reading alphabet so that the, the teach the people to start reading. And then usually with a lot of work and many times years of research, the Gospel of John can be prepared and people get to read and hear the Word of God for the first time. But until that time, uh, they hear from other people who explain to them what the gospel message is. And today, the theme of the service is everybody needs someone to be able to help interpret the scriptures to them. I don't care how old you are or when you started, we all need someone who's been working on the scriptures longer than we have uh, in, order to, to, to ch in order to care for us and in order to help us grow. And so what I want my younger friends to be able to know is, is some of you might actually be the ones who grew up and learn how to translate the scriptures, learn how to do that. Maybe within hearing of my voice now in this place and uh, also, uh, also across the, the, the cable, Armstrong cable, uh, someone out there might be one of the next ones to be able to help develop that. Why? because you want what I want in order to help people to be able to understand the scripture. I'm just curious, how many of you have a Bible study or a Sunday school class that you go to? Is there a chance I could see? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that you understand and grasp what I'm talking about. Every one of us needs someone who would help us with the scripture. Some of you are the teachers as well, but we need someone to be able to show it to us. And we're gonna see how that gets developed in the scripture. But uh, I want to just pray with uh, my younger friends and children here right at the moment if we could do that, okay? Thank you, Lord, for the young lives. Some of them have not even begun to read yet, and yet who will tell them about Jesus? Others of them have been reading for a while, and they still need someone to help them understand what the scriptures are dealing with. For every one of us, Lord, help us to invest in the lives of our younger friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kara Hall is down here and is going to be heading out with any of the children who, who are willing and want to go with her. And so you can just step out at this time. 
And I forgot it isn't just Carol, but Pam is also out there. So just so you know that you're welcome out there. As we look in here, get ready to sing Break Thou the Bread of Life is number 599. And please remain seated. Uh, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it is no surprise to you that we live in a very chaotic, constantly changing world. And the one constant that we have in our life is you. You are so faithful, pouring down your grace and your mercy and your love upon us. And we are so grateful for that, Lord. And as we celebrate communion later on, we confess to you those sins, the ones that were intentional, the ones that were unintentional. And we ask that we might have repentant hearts as you draw us closer to you. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who are feeling particularly anxious this morning, perhaps about a loved one, maybe about a relative or a neighbor. And Lord, we ask that you might calm our spirits Calm us so we can be contagious to others as we just reflect your love to those around us. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. You bless us every day. For those that are here in the sanctuary or listening at home, we know that you've been with us already and that you continue to be with us and give us the strength and the courage to represent you in the world in which we live. Lord, help us to remember that you are the light that opens our eyes, opens our ears, and opens our mouths to be able to profess before you that we want to share the good news with others. And Lord, we pray for those that are going through the difficult times, perhaps facing surgery this week, and we pray for the doctors, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, and pray that they will do the things that you have given them, and that is gifts gifts that they can share, and perhaps each one here does not realize how gifted they are, that you want us to be able to share with others, but particularly the good news of Jesus Christ. Be with Pastor Larry as he delivers the message. We're so grateful that he's back and had the opportunity to be with his family. But Lord, as he shares the word with us, may we hear it fresh this morning. And we pray all this as we come to you in prayer together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's 
Steve, I would ask you to read the scripture, but I've learned that you just won't do it. So. I've got words on mine. Scripture today is taken from the book to Acts, book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Beginning here in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Well, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, unless you visit, real worship doesn't take place. We come to worship because we know you have already come before us. We worship because we know you expect us to come into your presence. Do not allow the preacher or the hearer to stand in the way of what you want to do, Lord. Come, word of God, speak in Christ's name. Amen. Wondered, just wondered how many of you uh, had a maybe a Bible class or VBS or Sunday school class whenever you were very young. Some of you would have, some of you wouldn't. But uh, is there anyone who can remember being either in Sunday school or in VBS when you're age four or five? Anyone, can anyone remember that age bracket? Yeah, cool, cool. Um, any of you remember being in a class of some kind when you were a teenager? How many of you have been in a class as an adult? How many of you have never been in a class and you don't want the pastor to know it? <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I understand that. It's not my goal to put anyone on the spot here at this point at all. But we had a bishop here in 19, from 1980 to 1988. Uh, that's before a lot of your time. His name was Bishop James Alt. Um, he would have been a seminary teacher, I think, in Drew uh, at the United Methodist Seminary there. Oh, excuse me. He had been a seminary teacher there, and and uh, and he was, he was he was pretty deep, and he was very talented. But the one thing that he would say is that if <clears throat> it's always worse if I drink it and, and it doesn't work, then after that. But it's uh, he would say if if you can name five 
Sunday school or Bible school or vacation Bible school teachers, if you can name five teachers who taught you uh, when you were growing up, you probably had a very good religious education. That was an interesting statement. He said, if you can name five, I think I could name eight or nine uh, as I was thinking through that. If you can name five that were impactful, or, uh, even if they were no good, by the way, most of them loved you, though, which is good news. If you can name five, you probably had a good religious education. I look back, one of my earliest memories is uh, Mrs. Schaefer. Now, I wasn't related to Mrs. Schaefer, but she was a mother to my aunt that was married to my uncle. How's that sound? So it felt pretty close. Mrs. Schaefer would teach the Wednesday night children's ministry. And of course, this was 7.30 at night. You know, that, that, was whenever you, that was whenever every family ate at home together and then got out to the church and it would be over at 8.30 and you'd have the kids in bed by nine. That's the way it worked, okay? And so she would be in charge of the children. The adults would meet in the sanctuary for the prayer meeting, uh, Bible reading, scripture, music. We would do the same thing and she would have us sing songs. She would then tell us a Bible story and then she would also do a missionary story of some kind. And she had, a, she had a modern technique, one that I hardly see, uh, called flannel graph, okay? And uh, she used it really, really well. And I remember, even, at, you know, and of course, at that age bracket, you know, the, the four or five-year-olds would sit in those little chairs that, that they would always sit in the front and we sat in a straight row. And if you didn't sit in a straight row, someone was going down to get your mom and dad. So we, we sat there, you know? But Mrs. Schaefer was a sweetheart. I don't remember her being stirred at all. I just remember she, her face would glow when she'd talk about these Bible stories. And uh, she would talk about uh, the Apostle Paul. She'd talk about Jesus, David, uh, Goliath, Moses. And, and in all honesty, at that age bracket in my life, the way she talked about the Bible characters, they were every much as hero to me as what Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone or the Lone Ranger might be. If, if that is done with you and done for your children and for your grandchildren, then, then you find at a very early age that these were amazing characters in the Bible. One of the lessons I remember her teaching was this. It was, a, it was one about where Paul, I want to say he was at the church at Philippi, but I may be wrong, but that's what I'm picturing. Uh, whenever he, he finally was in trouble with him, as he would go around to some of those cities right there in that part of Greece, he would get in trouble with, uh, uh, with some of the ones from the synagogue who didn't want him speaking about Jesus being the Messiah. And so they would be out to get him. So word came to his host that the, the, the authorities were coming for him. And so they put him in a basket and lowered him out the window. And I love that story. She put that flannel graph picture of a, of a basket just underneath the, the window uh, of the, uh, you know, on, on the board that was right in front of me and showed Paul looking out the window. She took Paul out of the window, stuck it in behind that basket, you know, between the basket, and then she slid them both down, which on a flannel graph is not easy to do, okay? She slid them both down as I saw Paul get to the ground and escape. You might as well think Daniel Boone was running away from Blackhawk during that time. I, I was so impressed with that, and I have never forgotten some of the Bible studies and missionary stories that she would tell. She would usually talk about a boy and girl, a boy or a girl who, who was hearing about Jesus for the first time, whether it be Africa or somewhere in South America. Uh, and, and so she'd tell these missionary stories, and I was just uh, drawn to that Time and time again, I'm sure I misbehaved, and I'm sure they had to tell me to be quiet. Um, people still do uh, try to tell me to be quiet. So I, I get that. All I know is I had the luxury of having people who talked about the Word of God in a way that I was able to understand. In, in, the, you know, in the world of education, it's called readability, right? Readability is why, why first graders read different types of texts than what sixth graders read. Uh, let me give you an idea of someone who's a beginning reader here. Uh, Charlotte wants to build a fort. She gets a big cardboard box. She gets some strong tape. Her dad helps too. I realize if I struggle reading this, it's going to say a lot about me here. Uh, he gets some scissors. He cuts the cardboard. He makes windows and doors. Her brother wants to play. Her sister wants to play. Her friends want to play. That's called readability. There's no word more than two syllables 
uh, long. They are short sentences. And even the typing and the spacing of it is written in such a way so that a young reader has a chance to be able to start reading and to learn. But look how the same topic is dealt with for, with, a, with a reader who's a little more experienced. Charlotte desires uh, to construct a military fortress, but is lacking suitable material. However, she is soon able to acquire a cardboard box, and with the help of industrial grade packing tape, shears and staples, the child manages to erect a citadel of such impressive proportions that her siblings and neighborhood children are all eager to participate. In fact, that's one sentence. The last seven lines are all one sentence. So you, you see the, the difference in, in, in what's called readability. And one definition of readability is the ease with which a text can be read and understood. So the question comes to me, has anyone made the scriptures readable to you? Or do you look at it? Can you imagine if I was sitting in, in Mrs. Schaefer's front row and she handed me the King James book when I was four or five years old, said, Larry, would you read? Much like what I was asking Steve to do. It might as well have been empty. It might as well have no words in it at all because I would have struggled to be able to do that. However, at age four or five, before I ever had a written copy of God's word in my hand, I was beginning to understand that God loved me and that he worked through, through other people in their lives and they brought them to, brought them to Christ. I, I just absolutely love this and, and, and adore this. And, and she made the scriptures readable. She affected the readability for me of, of God's word. And uh, I want you to know my vocabulary has improved since that time. And I really am able to read on my own. And one of the things that, that literally turns me on in a great way is seeing people who have not really had anyone share with them how amazing these biblical characters are and, and the truth of the scriptures in such a way and that you can know God through the very words that come jumping off the pages. So today's scripture text that we're reading out of Acts chapter 8 um, shows the, the eunuch who is having difficulty with, uh, with the readability. He's, he's uncomfortable. He has gone to Jerusalem, a long ways away from, from uh, Ethiopia, and that's probably not just the, what we now know as a nation, but that region down there, that part where the Nile, Nile River forms, that'd be Sudan, Ethiopia, Tanzania, those, those countries in, in that part of the Horn of Africa is the best way to picture it. They were the ones that, that, that he was representing the queen. So he was a person of means. He was a eunuch. Um, so when he would come to Jerusalem in order to worship, uh, because of a passage in Deuteronomy where, where, uh, uh, where, where men in such a situation were not allowed to, to worship in the, in the temple and in the tabernacle, uh, he might not have even, been, and he was a foreigner, he might not have been allowed into the same place where the Jewish males were worshiping. He might have been out where the women were or where the Gentiles were. I, I don't really know. But chances are he was a god fear which were people who of, of other, uh, other nationalities, they weren't, they weren't Jewish, but they were ones who, who would attend synagogue and were learning the word. Whatever the case is, he's traveled to Jerusalem and he bought a scroll. Uh, I guess you would call it uh, Isaiah, right? I have a picture of this here. Uh, if we could just, you know, uh, fill up talking to, to the particular eunuch and... Um, and of course, he was reading in Isaiah 53. And so I like what the Spirit says to Philip. Draw near. I want you to go over near the chariot where that man is. <laughs> I don't know about you, but, but when the Spirit speaks to me, I want him to be very specific. You know, I want the Spirit to say to me what he wants me to do, how long to do it, and how to get it done. And all the Spirit did with Philip. And Philip had a gift in evangelism, by the way. He was quite an evangelist. This is not Philip, the, the disciple, uh, 12, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. This is Philip the evangelist who kind of came into leadership in the church about the same time Stephen and some of the other Greek or Hellenistic Jews came into, into, into uh, authority in the, in the body of Christ. And he says to Philip, go over to the chariot and draw near to him or stand near him. I really could preach a whole message just on this. I'm not going to, but I could. I, I, when, how, how many times do we just need simple obedience to God? 
Whenever we are, are felt, felt led to be able to touch base with someone, we may not even know why. We may not know. Uh, I, I, think of, I think of Isaac back here. You know, how, do, how does Isaac know exactly what God's going to do with him this summer when he gets to do ministry? Uh, how is he going to know? But he's obedient, he's going to go, and he's going to draw near somewhere, and he's going to begin to see what God has for him to be able to do. And uh, Isaac, we're praying for you, and we're awfully proud of you, okay? So, so that's happening here, and, and that's, what, that's what happens with Philip as he goes through there. So Philip is there listening, and he sees him reading. Don't forget, Hebrew probably wasn't his first language. Almost certainly wasn't his first language. And, uh, and so he's reading the scroll. And I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with, the, with the Old Testament and the, uh, and the New Testament, for that matter, is that there isn't any punctuation. And the words come running together. It wouldn't have been any easier for Steve if I'd have handed him a book in English, but didn't have any of the words broken up and didn't have any punctuation. Uh, so this could not have been very easy for him to be able to read. But he's reading the scroll uh, from the Hebrew in the book of Isaiah. Um, so what happens is you ask him is, is uh, and of course you ask, uh, do you understand what you're reading? And of course the eunuch said, how can I understand unless someone shows me the way? So I've got a picture here. He invites him up into the, uh, right up into the uh, chariot in order to begin reading to him and, and explaining to him. Uh, and so that's where we had picked up in, verse, uh, in verses 32 and 33. And I'm reading that out of, out of Acts. I just I already read that, but I just want to point that out to you again. Here's what the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Uh, who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now, you and I have been taught by, by Bible teachers all the time that that's really talking about Jesus. And yet, don't forget, don't forget uh, whenever Philip is teaching about that, he doesn't have the, the New Testament. He certainly knows about Jesus. He's teaching about Jesus. Uh, but he doesn't have the New Testament. Like, he couldn't, he couldn't quote Romans 3.23 and say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, he... He, he couldn't, uh, you know, he just, he just couldn't do one thing after another like that. Uh, and, and, uh, but what he did was he just went back through the scriptures um, because the eunuch says, who is he talking about? Is this Isaiah or someone else? And that is the cue. That's like the invite that Philip has to begin sharing in his life. Have you ever started to share some of the gospel with someone who, who didn't want to hear it from you? you you're, first of all, you're lucky if they don't go, that ah, don't preach to me. You know, if you ever get to hear that because... No one likes that. I wouldn't like it if you were preaching to me. Uh, I, I get it, you know. Uh, but, but what he began to do was since the genuine question had been asked, he started showing them through the scriptures how all these words pointed towards Jesus. Another thing that I think affected the, uh, affected the, the, the eunuch was, was when he saw this line that says, who can speak of his descendants? In other words, in other words he, he doesn't have any children. Whoever he's reading about doesn't have any children. Does that maybe sound like something the eunuch might identify with? He doesn't have any children. Uh, no descendants. How tough is that in, in, Jewish, in Jewish life and in Jewish ritual um, where, the, where the faith was passed down? Uh, it's called, it's called a natal type of a thing, N-A-T-A-L, uh, where, where the truths and, and laws were passed down from the father to the children. So the blessings to the children and the land and everything was passed down uh, through, through the line of, of having children and grandchildren. The eunuch would never have that. It's possible that when he went to Jerusalem, he really was not able to get very close to what was going on in the temple. So he buys the text. He buys Isaiah. And he starts to read it. But how can he deal with it if no one explains to him um, what he is reading about in the first place. See, this wasn't just a readability thing by how many syllables were in the word. He had no context in order to understand what was getting ready to take place. And Philip offered it. Now go with me to the New Testament. Because we opened up this service uh, by talking about how Jesus stood up in the temple. On the Sabbath day, he had come back to Nazareth. Uh, and, and when he had come back to Nazareth, he was ready to, to begin talking about... Uh, uh, ready to read the scripture. And I've got a picture here, if I could, could have that one real quick. 
Um, and, and here he was, he stood up in the temple. There would be a person who would keep track of the, of the scriptures, store the, the, the scrolls. The scroll would have been handed to him. In fact, it would have been laid out and even pointed to where he was supposed to read because this would have been a prescribed reading. And he picks the day in which he's reading uh, some of the stuff that's coming from Isaiah. And he reads that, you know, um, you know, where the you know, the lame walk and the blind see. And, and when he gets done reading about this, he says, this day, he sits down, remember? He, he, closes, he sits the scroll down. He sits down, which would be to teach. And he basically says, this day, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was proclaiming to be the one they talked about in Isaiah, which is exactly what Philip the evangelism does. He lets them know that Jesus is the one that's being spoken about in Isaiah. I spent a little bit of time on the, on the phone uh, just yesterday afternoon uh, trying to, to bug Jackie Wagner just a little bit. You know, she, she's a neighbor, I'm a neighbor. And uh, one of the things that will happen when I go by Jackie's house, sometimes there'll be a lot of cars there. And uh, because she opens up her home all the time, some of you have been in her Bible studies and know that she is really a very gifted teacher of the scriptures. I know you know that. And she's uh, got a pastor's heart and, and we're all blessed with that. And I just, I just asked her uh, because, and I did not even realize that she'd shared a little bit last Sunday uh, with you. And uh, so I just asked her if she would share a little bit of how she was discipled. And, and she told me about her experience when she was in ninth grade and feeling so, so drawn to God and wanting to be involved with whatever he had. Uh, and all the time and how clearly she, she felt like she had experienced his presence. And then she just stayed involved in her, her congregation and as a student. And, uh, and she probably led many times. She would have been in any class that would have been offered. And bit by bit, um, the, the scripture had been made readable in her life. And she spent the rest of her life making it readable for people like you and me. I love to hear her expound on the word of God. That's exactly what Jesus did. And when you read Paul, that's what he would do. He would stand, read the scriptures. When we come to this place, you, you can read the scripture without being here, by the way. But when we come to this place, we will read the word of God. And we also will try to check to see how the church has interpreted <clears throat> these scriptures over the years as well. We, we will look to see for 2,000 years, the New Testament scriptures have been interpreted by, by the Holy Spirit and by God's leaders and people. And so for that reason, it's really important for you and me to pass it on to, to the next generation. There are people who read the scriptures and they come up with things drastically different from what I believe has been taught for the last 2,000 years. And I realize how important it is for men like Philip, women like Jackie, people like you and me to attend the teaching of the word and also then to, to be sharing it. I've got a, one last cartoon to be able to, able to show you here uh, where Philip says, do you understand? Do you understand what you are reading? Um, if I could have that, that next slide, if that's possible in that thing. Uh, but anyhow, do you understand what, what you are reading? And how can I unless someone guides me is what the man says. How can I unless someone guides me? They tell me that the literacy rate in, in Ethiopia at that time might have been about 1%. 99 people could not read and probably one could read. And this Ethiopian eunuch was one who could read. And he had to have someone show him what this was all about. And you know that church history records that the church in Ethiopia grew very rapidly in the first century. Makes you wonder, right? There had been some contact with Solomon a few centuries before that. But in this particular case, uh, it seems like they had ready hearts so that when the spirit began to work in Ethiopia, their hearts just melted and they followed him. And is it possible maybe even that this Ethiopian eunuch was part of that? Did he bring back the scripture and, and did God use that to ignite a revival right in the midst of what they're doing? Now think about that. That part of the world right now is very hostile towards the followers of Jesus in many ways. But it's mostly what they perceive to be religion of the West as opposed to who Jesus is. And uh, could it be that, that we're waiting for, for God to do the very same miracle of revival here as well as it happened there at that point in time? So that's my question today. Do you, do you understand what you're reading? I really want to challenge you to join a Bible study, a prayer group, a short-term class, a Sunday school class. 
I think if, if we are ever have any hopes of remaining a faithful congregation and faithful to Jesus, if we have any hopes of, of being to be in the right position whenever the Spirit of God begins to move in our lives again, then we need to be connected with that and find those people who can help make the scriptures readable to you and to me. I need the Mrs. Schaefer's to do with the youngest children. I need the Phillips, the evangelist, to be able to share with other adults. I need women like Jackie and those of you who would be willing to minister to other women uh, and men. Uh, they're just very gracious. They, the men can, some men can handle it, some men can't. But who are willing to minister to, to guys. I know that I'm willing to be ministered to and, uh, and, and learn from people like that. So here's my challenge. Find a person who will read the Bible with you. Even if you do it separately, reading the same way. Find another person. Find someone who would be willing to be a teacher to you. One of the classes that I'm talking about. And we've got options. And if there's no option that works for you, let me know. We'll work on one. Find someone to share with what you're learning. And then would you just read the scripture to someone else? Would you use your best reading skills and read to a child? Best reading skills and read to, to, a, to a teenager? Uh, maybe in your home? Will you make the scriptures readable to people and help that to come alive in their spirit? Because when the spirit is ready to work like that, if we have taught the scriptures, I know my children, uh, two of th my three children did not respond to, did not respond to the heartfelt falling of, of Jesus uh, until, until they were in their 30s. And yet they, the, the Bible stories came back to them so fast. And in both their cases, those two are hosting, hosting Bible studies and teaching people the word of God and sharing their faith with other people. Why? Because we made sure as parents that there were people making the scriptures readable to them. Carol Hall, by the way, was a teacher to my oldest two boys uh, whenever they were in second and third grade. So, so we made a point to have our children where scriptures would be read to them. And, and I really want to challenge you for your children and your grandchildren to work on that as much as you can. And I'd leave you with this. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Well, we're going to share in... In the, we're going to share in the, the sacrament of communion at this point in time as we recognize that Jesus paid the price for you and for me. The communion is one of the ways in which Jesus made the gospel readable. Communion is one of the ways in which we break the bread. It's, it's his body broken. And when we drink from the cup, his blood was poured out for you and for me. And when you share in this body, uh, it, is, uh, it is the blessing of being able to, being able to experience him. And then it strengthens your witness as you go from this place. Is there anyone who might not have received a, a, one of the communion cups? Uh, we have those in the back. If you raise your hand, we can get to you. By we, I mean angel. Thank you. And while she is passing those around to the people who are needing that, I just invite you to bow your heads. You know, if you truly and earnestly repent of your sins and live in faith and charity with God's people around you, then draw near with faith and take this sacrament to, to, to your comfort and to your fellowship with Christ. If anything is standing between you and God right now, will you ask him for forgiveness? Heads bowed, eyes closed, just you and God. 191, Jesus loves me.
if you look in your hymnal on page 191, you don't have to do that, but if you ever do, you'll see that the lady who wrote that, I believe wrote, I want to say 1859, but you can check later to see what, what year that was in. But she lived in West Point, and she taught West Point cadets. The lady who wrote these words, uh, the Bible tells me so, uh, was, uh, was a class teacher. Whenever she died, the cadets and, and West Point honored her with a military funeral at the time when she had done. Now, the, the, the song that we, that we sing now that has a very simple tune was designed by an, another person has been used for children all that time. But please know that this was written for West Point cadets. Well, may God make the scriptures readable to you. May he give you an opportunity to learn, and may he give you an opportunity to read to someone else. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.